Thank you, um, Russ, again. And uh, yeah, this safety deal is a big deal, um, you know, especially dealing with larger animals. And a lot of times um, we don't realize or don't think about it. Um, you know, even even the smaller animals can be dangerous, but you know, especially our horses um, and larger animals can, can hurt you. So, so I want to spend just a little bit of time on a little bit of animal behavior stuff and just things to think about from a safety perspective, because that'll make you think about facility design. You know, kind of what what you're doing, and then um, we'll talk about kind of beef. So, Tyler, I want to say I really appreciated your uh, your your talk there. Um, it. it uh, it's really cool to see, I think, that there's a whole new wave of younger people that want to get involved in agriculture and want them, they are passionate about, you know, where food comes from and how to do food. And they're doing things in a whole different way and a whole different manner than, you know, people at an advanced age like me are, you know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's exciting. I'm really, really excited. I mean, you, you see that in a lot of different aspects of, um, of society, but I think particularly in agriculture, we're seeing kind of that blending of some of the traditional cultural stuff that, that you're trying to learn here, you know, with the technology and, and some of the new ways of doing stuff. Because we can't keep doing things the way we've always done. That's probably any business the most dangerous statement is, well, we've always done it that way, right? And so, so, so it's pretty neat. So I'm excited. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, your talk. Just thinking about, you know, taking a leap of faith and let's get after it. You know, and see what happens. But there are a ton of really, really good resources um, to to help you with that. Um, and so I want to lend you money. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'll take a chance. You know, I mean it. Anyway, so safety with animals, I think, is really, really important. Um, those of you that um, do play workman's comp on a farm or ranch, uh, that is, I think that's the highest category next to like knife juggling or something. I mean, it's pretty, <laughs> uh, farm and ranch, uh, the workman's comp insurance is, is very, very expensive because injuries do happen working around livestock and equipment. And there's a lot of different, different things like that. You know, and then the other thing I mentioned in my other, my other talk, though, too, is, is especially on a lot of these smaller farms and ranches, the people we're working with are our friends and family and, and people that we love. And so we just need to take care of them and so be cognizant of that. So just some real quick guidelines. And I think most of these are common sense, but, you know, caring for animals with kindness and respect because, again, those animals at one point are going to make that ultimate sacrifice for us. Mm -hmm. And so... So giving them the proper respect that they deserve for, for that is, is important. Um, wearing good shoes, um, especially around <laughs> heavier animals. I mean, how many um, accidents happen with flip-flops and horses, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you think we're kind of kidding, but you know, that's just... just that's like wearing flip-flops on motorcycles. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. So that, that's tough. You know, um, being quiet, we'll talk a little bit about sound when approaching animals, using adequate restraining and handling um, facilities, and then always thinking about an escape route, you know, especially if you're you're a pen with something, especially animals you don't know. Um, probably the most dangerous animals are the ones you do know, you know, that you have full trust in and you let your, your guard down, you're not cognizant of that, those kind of things. So anyway, and then, um, this one I don't necessarily agree with, but but uh, says do not handle livestock when you're alone. But you know again, that's we don't have a choice a whole lot of times. So just being cognizant of, of kind of the kind of the safety stuff. So in a couple things in particular to beef cattle, beef cattle are easily spooked by loud sudden noises of movement. And so we've talked about um, some different animals um, this morning, and. Um, beef animals are predators or prey. Yeah. Both. <laughs> Sheep and goats. Uh, they're all prey animals, right? You know, so their natural instinct is to get away from you, right? Because we are predators, right? And so there's some kind of cool vision stuff and stuff to think about that's different because they're prey animals versus us as predators. But again, that easily spooked by loud sudden movements is, is, is because you are a threat to them. 
And then a lot of the ways that we interact, because naturally we are predators, it goes against our biology and instinct to be in harmony with prey animals, <coughs> if you really think about it. And so, you know, we have to consciously um, change some of our, our things. But anyway, beef cattle tend to kick forward and then backward and sometimes sideways. You know, so, oh, yeah. so <laughs> you've been there. Um, and, and done that. And, and again, because they're prey animals, what's the location of their eyes? Where are their eyes at? The side of their head. So they have a completely different vision than what we do. So sheep, goats, cattle, um, those prey animals. And so why are their eyes on the side of their head? Yeah, what do they spend most of their day doing? Especially the ruminant ones. Grazing. If they're head down, grazing, right? And so that, that's an adaptation they have. So they have a pretty wide peripheral vision, right? So they got a blind spot right in front of them. they got a blind spot right in back of them. But they've got a very wide, wide um, peripheral vision. But that vision is different um, because we have, because of our eye placement as predators, we can see, well, not, again, not at my advanced age, but <laughs> I, I can't read anymore. I can tell you whether a gnat is a boy or a girl at 100 yards, but I can't read anymore. Um, but, um, but we have vision for hunting, for, for seeing long distance. We have a lot of very good depth perception. Cattle, sheep, and goats don't have that depth perception. So there's different ways that they perceive the world. So it's kind of, kind of neat. Anyway, um, dairy cattle generally tend to be more docile than beef cattle because they're handled more often. Um, you know, so they're a lot of times less fearful of people. They can still be easily startled. Um, you know, and then use particular caution when animals have injuries because again, they'll try to mask that as prey animals the best they can, but if you touch a sensitive spot or something, they can kick or, or um, hurt you. Swine in particular can bite. <laughs> Um, it can bite with a lot of force, um, so you have to be careful with swine. Um, they they're big. You know what's a what's a mature sow weigh? Uh, I mean, someone can weigh 450, 500 pounds pretty easy, and that's a lot of weight. If they get <laughs> they get rolling, they got a lower center of gravity than you, and they knock you down. You know, you know. So, um, sheep sheep are flock animals. They have the instinct to to be together and they may feel threatened if they're separated. And they'll go right through the middle of you to get back to their buddies. And so, um, again, be careful when you separate one off. Um, rams may charge your butt. Um, you know, I know in, in cattle, particularly some of the worst ones are the ones that are bottle babies. You know, that you rub their head all the time and they have no fear of you and they like to play with you. Um, it's kind of fun when they're 80 pounds, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> when they're 800 pounds, that, 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 <laughs> that leaves a little bit, it's a different deal. So, so anyway, so as much fun as it is and as much as we love our animals, probably not good to teach some of those habits. And so think about that. Um, I talked about animal sight. So in addition to have, having a different field of vision, um, cattle in particular have what they call dichromatic vision. So we have three color receptor cones. Um, cattle, um, and I believe sheep and goats also have only two. And so that changes the way that the colors are perceived in their vision. And so that dichromatic vision um, creates that lack of, lack of depth perception, but it also makes contrast greater. So that's why like in handling facilities or where you're trying to move animals, shadows are a lot scarier because that depth, that contrast is, is a whole lot different. Because you've seen that, you know, cattle moving, you know, they balk at a shadow. They shouldn't balk at a shadow or a different change in color of the ground or something. But, but that, that, because of that dichromatic vision, they perceive it differently. So just kind of understanding that. Um, animal hearing. So the two main ways that we communicate with animals, number one, by sight, you know, by you know, being able to put pressure on them. Um, release pressure and get them to move. And the other way is hearing. And so usually sight will take care of it. Um, but sometimes we need to need to use um, you know sh sh you know some you know those or sometimes maybe a little louder than that. <laughs> but um, anyway, they can perceive. And it's kind of cool. So Temple Grandin is an animal behaviorist from Colorado State 
um, pretty famous, has done a lot of research that uh, talks about how animals, animals can perceive tone in your voice. So the worst day, or the day that you do not want to be working your animals is the day that you're mad, because they perceive that. So you either become scared or aggressive because of that. So anyway, um, all these uh, prey animals are herd animals, and so again, one of those most dangerous ones is when a lone animal is separated from the rest, and they can um, become um, pretty agitated. Every animal has what they call a flight zone, and so Temple Grandin kind of talks about it like a force field, you know. So, you know, COVID has changed our force field a little bit, right? You know, I always have a force field. So, as I get closer here to Keisha, you know, she's being very brave, but like her instinct is she wants to move away, and so I'm kind of pushing on that bubble around her, right? And so all animals have that force field. Some of those desert cattle <laughs> um, down there. That force field, that bubble may be a half mile away if they perceive you riding into that and they'll move away from you. They'll, they'll get away. You've seen that. Um, old broke show heifers or old show goats, that, that may be four inches before they'll, oh, somebody's there. You know, so so th that flight zone is, is different, but we can use that to apply pressure to move animals, to ask them to do um, what we want them to do. Um, Handling is always safer when an animal is moved quietly. And again, um, Temple Grandin's research shows when you get mad, how how long is it before you calm back down, Gene? It depends on how mad you are, right? Um, so animals all have kind of a, a a thinking and a reacting side of the brain. And so if you push that reacting where you make them mad it takes them about 20 minutes to level back out to where they can think again and, and, and do so. So if you if you get one, you've, you've made a cow or a sheep or an animal um, mad enough that they, they're not thinking at that point, they're just reacting. And so you need to take about that 20 minutes for them to get back to, back to normal. Um, we talk about point of balance and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that's just kind of a way that we get in front of animals, we can move them back, or we get behind that point of balance, they'll move away from us. And that's just kind of, again, pushing on that, on that bubble. Making sure that we have good hygiene is vital to good livestock management. Um, crowded pens, you know, having um, too many animals in a pen is, is a huge mistake, especially if we're trying to handle them, because again, we don't have that escape route or a way to get out. And I kind of gave you the answer here, but for, but do livestock have good memories? Those of you that have handled livestock before, if a cow doesn't like going into a chute because she's had a bad experience there, she's not going to want to go in there, right? And so our our job as good stockmen and good handlers is, is to create positive experiences. You know, they're not always going to be positive, but make it as least stressful as, as we can. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, kind of going on a tangent, but um, Dr. Grandin talks about a horse that had an aversion to alcohol breath because that horse had been abused by somebody that um, drank a lot. So that horse, when somebody approached it with alcohol in its breath, had got extremely agitated. So it's kind of interesting to, to think about that, that memory and stuff like that. Um, you know, we train our dogs, we train our horses, we train our kids, you know, we, we do a lot of training and tuning up on, on stuff. A lot of times we don't train, you know, our cows or our sheep or our goats. Um, I don't know if chickens are really trained. Um, if you want to get to be a good livestock handler, <laughs> got a flock of chickens around. <laughs> that'll, that'll humble you a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, but I think that, that, training, that training component is, is pretty, pretty important. Also understand that there are genetic differences. You know, there's genetic differences within a breed and between breeds. Um, animals that have escaped, uh, you know, is, is generally not an immediate threat. Let them take that 20, 30 minutes to calm down. And a lot of times, you know, especially sheep and goats are really fun. This is a kind of a neat deal because they want to be together. And so they'll go to other ones. So if you, instead of chasing them around, let them kind of get back around you kind of um, take care of that. So again, you can also have aggressive behavior. Um, 
males again to try to establish dominance. Um, you know, and the reason why, you know, again, I think about from a social aspect, the things that I do, the practices that I have in raising cattle on my operation, if I took somebody that did not agree with my lifestyle or, or with, with eating meat, would they be able to accept the practices that I have there? Um, some of them yes, some of them no. And so, so I think that we need to work on, talk about castration, you know, for, for example, castration, you know, we can either knife cut or we can ban, which is more humane. So, so banding is, is putting an elastic, for those of you who don't know, elastic ring around, you know, above the testicles and allowing that um, to cut off the blood circulation allows that, that scrotum and the testicles to fall off about two weeks, two to three weeks. Um, knife cutting is an acute, <laughs> uh, very sudden um, cutting of the scrotum and removal of the, of the testicles. And so I've thought a lot about this, and I, I'm not I'm not sure I, I don't know the answer. Um, so you knife cut sheep or goats or or, or calves, um, they will vocalize pain um, a lot of times, and then they'll go back to moms and they'll be uncomfortable, but they'll get back to somewhat normal within a day or so. Um, the banding you don't have that acute pain that that vocalization, expression of pain, but it's a longer duration of pain. Um, so, like I said, I don't know which one is better, which one is worse. <coughs> you know, but we we know that that we need to do that, though. We need to castrate them because they'll become aggressive with each other in their next situation. And and um, so, but anyway, you got a band. You better put two or three or four bands on it, just yeah. in case one or two breaks. Yeah, and just be sure to follow up and keep an eye on them, for sure. And, and if you ban, make sure you use a tetanus shot, because uh, they, they can be susceptible to that. Give maternal aggression. Um, you know, animals are generally protective of their babies, and so just being, being aware of that. So, having good equipment. I don't want to get the beef here, so. Um, things that can improve your facility safety is just, you know, look at where cattle are or animals are having troubles. Like if they're always getting through a fence at a certain spot or they're always walking at a certain spot. Try to figure out how you can fix that. So again, when handling large and small animals, it's impossible to be completely safe, but um, just be aware of your surroundings, be aware of some of those things. So again, that was, and thank you Russ for allowing me to do that, but I think it's important to think about when we consider adding animals, that there is an element of danger and, and consciousness that we need to have for, from a safety standpoint. So beef cattle, um, identifying your market, identifying what are the challenges to that market, and then planning. So for marketing, um, I, I told you I'm a commercial beef cow calf producer. That's, that's primarily um, what, I, what I do with my calves. I, and I'll share with you, um, I'm, I've got about 260 cows right now, and basically between my fixed and my variable costs, and variable costs are changing because of the fuel prices and, and hay prices are going up quite a bit. Um, but if I can, if I can net um, 100 to $150 per animal unit, I think that's probably reasonable. Would you say for the Arizona ranch? In most years, I mean, that, you hopefully, <laughs> then that's hopefully positive rather than, <laughs> than than in the red, you know. So, so if you're thinking about a small farm on a commercial type situation, that's not that's not going to be sustainable from an economic standpoint, you know. Um, you know, especially if you want to make make a living from that. And so. Um, Again, I'm not the sharpest guy in the world, which you found out this morning, but I know that in order to be profitable, there's two ways that you can do that. You can either increase your income or decrease your expenses. That makes sense? Either make more or spend less, or a combination thereof in order to be profitable. And so what I've chosen to do, because I, I'm limited in 
how many cows I can run based on my acreage and so forth. Um, I've tried to add some value to those to those calves, and so I've I've kind of done a little bit of niche marketing. So on my commercial cows, um, I use bulls that have carcass merit, um, and I can do gen genetic testing that indicate that those cows, those calves that are going to market have better carcass, better meat quality characteristics, they'll feed better. Um, I participate in what they call a beef quality assurance program, which is a certification program that I am practicing good animal husbandry and, and those practices. Um, I am Prop, you know, properly administering vaccinations and try to set those animals up. So I'm trying to do things like that to add value to the commercial side. Um, and you know, and that's also my best interest because I have less sickness and less, less death loss if I take care of them properly. But I've also tried to kind of fill a niche market and I told you I was doing some club goats, but I also try to do some club calves. And so sell 4-H animals or 4-H and FFA animals that'll go to, to different fairs. And I've had mixed success doing that. Um, I just had, um, I have an annual sale, which I invite people out and they come and we have an auction and, and um, I sold 15 calves this year and I averaged um, 2400 bucks on those calves, which sounds pretty good, right, for seven, eight month old calves. Um, but there's a lot of investment in marketing and, and advertising and, you know, everybody, you know, comes there and can uh, make ball caps and, you know, and those are 15 bucks a piece, and the feed them lunch, and, you know, advertising. And anyway, so that adds up. And I'm not sure whether that's, I'm, I'm generating more income. Um, and as a, at 2400 I'm okay because it still is more than what my ad costs are there. But I'm not sure if that drops down to $1,600 average, which it has, um, whether that makes sense to do that. And so... Um, Anyway, so I'm trying to identify a niche market that, that I can do. Um, the biggest one and the most obvious one on the beef side is doing direct sales of beef. Um, again, we know that there is a huge demand for knowing where and how beef was produced. You know, people want to put a name and a face with what they're consuming. Um, and so there's a ton of opportunities there. To do that and you can do that in a lot of different ways we talked about certification programs if you want to do a certification program if you want to um, you know have an all-natural or a grass-fed one of the questions was does alfalfa being fed alfalfa hay qualify as grass-fed most grass-fed programs yes you know and that's how how they finish them um, but you but you're for sure going to have to identify how do you want to sell that do you want to sell halves quarters um, that gets really, really difficult. Um, you know, we were talking about that during the break. You know, it's really, really easy to sell the fillets and the New York strips and the, and the T-bones, the ribeyes, you know, but not as many people want shank and chuck and some of those lower quality cuts. So now does that go on a burger and how much do you need to charge for a burger? Anyway, there's a lot of, a lot of tremendous opportunities, you know, but also um, some potential roadblocks there. The other ones I think that, that we don't think about when, and not necessarily in beef, but um, we were talking about in goats. There's a, an operation that um, Russ was telling me about that charges 100 a month to board goats. Um, you know, yeah, I've, per I've, goat or? <laughs> per goat. I, I mean, I've, I've fed goats. I know I could do it for less than 100 a month. <laughs> keep an eye on them. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's some opportunities kind of thinking a little bit differently there. Goat yoga. Who, I mean, you know, we, 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 you know, we're, we're chuckling a little bit here, but that's a real deal. I mean, there are people that that crave that connection to an animal, right? That, and we know it's important. How many pets are in, in U.S. households now? I, I can't give you a number, but I, I, an interesting statistic that I saw was there's more pets in U.S. households than there are kids. More households with pets than kids. You know, and, that, and, and, that, and, that's, and that tells us that there's a craving for that connection to animals. Now, I'm not sure that you want to do cow yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be awful tough. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, but, there's, but there's some kind of cool opportunities to, to do some stuff. So, so maybe with, you know, the miniature 
cattle, you know, as far as kind of like a pet or an attraction or or or, or something like that. So, uh, so what I'm doing is I'm encouraging you to think a little, you know, like Tyler, think a little bit out of the box, think about, you know, something different that, you know, maybe you really love animals and you want to share that. Um, there's maybe a little different way to do that. The other one that I put up there is, is sport. Um, you know, I talked about the 4-H and FFA kind of exhibition animals, but, um, you know, like buck and bulls. Buck and bulls is a huge, huge industry. Um, you know, and I, it'll be interesting to see over the next 20 years what happens from an animal rights standpoint or an animal welfare standpoint with, with some of those, those events. But Also but, Corrientes. Yeah, Corriente roping cattle are mm-hmm. worth yes. quite a bit. You know, and they're a smaller, less input type of animal. Um, that you can get into. So there's, and, and Wickenburg right now is a team roping capital yep. for, the winter time. For, winter, for the winter time. I mean, there's so many ropers down here and so many um, steers over there. So anyway, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of, if you want to be involved in the cattle business on a small scale, a lot of different ways to cut that, you know, to, to try to be creative. I will tell you though, that you're not going to do it by doing it the traditional, conventional, commercial way on a small scale. It's just tough, you know, to, you know, for it to be anything more than, than a hobby. Um, so anyway, so think about this. So we talked a little bit about production and pro- so bottlenecks. So what are bottlenecks for production, um, processing, and marketing? And I think our biggest one right now is processing, trying to figure out, you know, who's going to harvest these. Um, we know that that um, several we talked about that the processors right now, there's a lot of them that have dropped their their um, either state or US or USDA certification um, because they didn't need to have it. Now will that start to change back as that supply demand kind of evens out? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, marketing, marketing is also um, really, really an important thing to think about because um, not all of us are cut out to be direct marketers. <laughs> Some of us is. probably shouldn't talk to the public at all. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and you see that. I mean, you, you've probably been to farmer's markets and there's the grumpy person that's selling stuff that probably, you know, maybe they sent somebody else, they'd probably do a little more business. But, um, you know, because people, those consumers want to make a connection with you, right? You know, and so, so thinking about what are, what are those different, um, different bottlenecks. And then, you know, the last point is just kind of the planning part of that. So you're going to have to adjust your plan. So when you started out with your farm, um, did you kind of have a vision of right now where it was going to be, or do you have to adjust that? It's always adjusting. It's always adjusting, always think, on the plan. I think I 3D modeled my property probably 20 times. Right. And this is go here, and this will go there. And yeah, so being smart enough and, and creative enough to to try to take advantage of some opportunities that, that you may see, um, you know, but being flexible enough that you can adapt to those things is, is, is pretty important. I know, and I, I told you that, you know, I'm at about 260 cows and I can't make a living just on those cows. I mean, so I, I do other stuff, like, because I have to have a truck and trailer to haul my animals to market, I also do custom hauling for people, you know, for ranchers in my area. Um, I. I'm fortunate enough that I do um, some work for um, some breed organizations on cattle handling and safety. So we do some some clinics and stuff. You know, so just you know, I'm also um, a part-time auctioneer. Um, you know, and so there's different things that you can do to kind of fill those gaps in. You know, until you can become you know completely sustainable. Um, but if you really want to do it, I promise you, you can do it. Um, I. I, um, kind of like Tyler, started with nothing, and I have most of that left. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, I didn't have a whole lot of capital, and I, I caught, a, a, caught a few lucky breaks. But, you know, the biggest challenge to me was patience. I'm not a very patient person. I, you know, I want to make stuff happen. And um, it took until I was 40 to get my first legitimate lease at number of cows. Um, and it turns out everything that I did up to that point built up for me to be able to take advantage of that and to be um, halfway successful doing it. But being patient to that point was really, really difficult. So anyway, that's uh, kind of my story. Yeah. I don't know if you heard. I heard the other day 
hate is going to go out of sight, for one thing. Uh, I know we sell alfalfa for sixteen fifty a bale, um, and Conway uh, is I think fifteen bucks a bale. I heard a lot of I hate is getting shipped over to Texas, and hay is going to be kind of scarce for a while. And if you're going to supplement with hay, you might want to think about something else. I don't know about uh, Bermuda. I don't know how that's doing, but uh, I know the hay is. Gonna get really bad around here for a while. Yeah, no, I'm hearing three hundred dollar a ton of hay. Pretty, I mean, it's pretty, you know, two fifty to three hundred dollars. So for those of you not in the hay market, one twenty to one eighty was kind of our market the past few years. You know, that's going to be almost double. So if you are doing a grass fed beef deal with hay, you need to account for that. You know, whereas, you know, we we always think in like four H F A, we can feed a steer from weaning to finish for about twelve to fifteen hundred bucks. You know, and that's just, you know, with because we're not buying commodity-based grains, you can do it in a feedlot cheaper than that because you're buying semi-trucks, loads full or rail cars full. But, um, you know, on a just a backyard basis, twelve fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 is what we thought we could feed them for. I think with the way grain and hay is going, you're going to have to bump that up 25 to probably 50%. I mean, you're probably, you know, probably 2000 bucks is probably not an unreasonable amount to budget for finishing a steer from weaning to, to We harvest. got a lot of ranchers in the store um, buying grain and stuff and they're starting to complain a little bit because the grain and, and the chicken feed and stuff is, is going up the roof. You ever met a rancher who didn't complain? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just one more thing to <laughs> No, and I'm teasing you, but, but, but you're exactly right. I mean, that, those production costs are going up. You know, what's, what's fuel costs are, are also, you know, well, having a tremendous impact. Well, a lot of too, on the cost was because of COVID, um, because at the uh, uh, plants, you know, people were getting laid off um, because of COVID and everything else, so the price started going up, yeah. you know. Uh, where before, you might be able to buy a bag of grain for, you know, 10, 12 bucks. Now it's 16, 17, 18 bucks a bag. Well, yeah, just try to get shipping. Yeah. So oh, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. shipping. Yeah. Shipping's tough. I, I am out of time, and I apologize, um, and hopefully I didn't lie to you too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>